What's up everyone? I hope you're all having a fantastic day. To get us started on today's video, we've got this tweet from the Digital Asset Investor. Things seem to be a little heated over there today. He tweeted, boy, these people have no shame to interview Jay Clayton as if he's some innocent bystander observing crypto from afar. He ran the freaking agency for years and helped create the regulatory uncertainty that crypto is in to this day. Shame on you, Squawk CNBC, Andrew Ross Sorkin, Becky Quick, and Joe Squawk. Journalism is only alive in social media now. By the way, ask him about China and Alibaba next time if you really want to get over the target. And then finally, Crypto, okay. Um, why is there not some actual rules and regulations and some bright lines about what, what we're doing? And when we ever get there, or are we just going to keep punting the ball? Um, it was very interesting what happened in Europe, where, where Europe has said, we are going to try to figure out how to take crypto, which crypto is... We, we use it to describe products. It's actually a technology right. because it covers a wide spectrum of products. Europe just said, we're going to try to figure out how to bring crypto technology into our financial regulatory system in a in a nice right. bumpy way. Right now, what we've decided to do is keep it out of the traditional financial system. Yeah. That's clearly the policy and work it out of the courts. The, the, courts, the courts are not an efficient place to resolve classification issues around securities, commodities, and the like. And therefore, therefore, we need, right now we're, we're we're not in a spot where, what I would say is the technology is going to come into the traditional financial system in any kind of smooth way. That's what we should focus on. I think French Hill, you have French Hill on the other day. He he is trying to push forward with this. We, okay. I, I do agree with what I do agree with Gary that securities covers a very wide. Swath. Is it theory of both security? He got in big trouble. I mean, is Ethereum a security? He got a big trouble not answering that. You no, know, Andrew and I did a, did a thing years ago. And can, can I can I take thirty seconds? I mean, uh, things things can go from being a security to not a security. A plague. Let's say we all want to put our production here and here on Broadway. We go to people and we say, you know what? Give us a thousand dollars. We'll give you a hundred tickets. Plane that may not come to market for you know a couple of years. At that point. Those hundred tickets, they're definitely securities. People are people are taking those tickets, hoping that we're going to be very successful, put on a play, and instead of them being worth ten dollars, they're worth a hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars. Let's say we do that. The play does beautifully. Five, seven years later, you go to the box box office and you buy a ticket. It's just a ticket. So you can really yeah, but is a security. Are they, right now, these things are secured. So they, they are. But they can, but they can change to not be. So on, on Ether, I don't, I don't know all, all of the facts, but it has many more hallmarks of just being a ticket than it does of being a means to raise money. As always, welcome back to Money Side, your favorite crypto news channel. If you're new here, welcome to the XRP Army. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. That way you don't miss out on our daily crypto news updates. Another update now from Mr. Man XRP. He shares a video of Ripple co-founder Chris Larson. McKinsey on payments sits down with the co-founder of Ripple Labs to discuss the nuts and bolts of the Ripple protocol, the implications for the correspondent banking model, and the emergence of an internet of value. Chris Larson Larson speaks saying that the bigger opportunity is between countries. There's no notion for an internet of value. There's no global switch for value. Listen in. Well, that, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of discussion going on within countries. Um, and there's, you know, many countries that do have, uh, you know, very fast payments. Um, I think uh, so that's, but in the U.S. there's definitely a lot of opportunity to move things forward and it probably will. Um, it seems like it's moving in the right direction. It's going to take time. There's a lot of constituents that have to be kept happy. But it's, uh, I think the bigger opportunity is, you know, between countries. Um, you know, again, there's just no notion of an internet for value or sort of a global switch for, for value. So the only way around that is uh, this kind of series of correspondent banking relationships, which is basically controlled by about five or six global money center banks. And what that means is then, uh, you know, very advanced uh, technological banks like uh, CBW have to use a series of correspondence, pay a lot of money, um, uh, have a pretty slow process of, you know, going between uh, countries. And what you'd like to see is uh, a system where a CBW could correspond directly with a, a small bank in Germany, like a Fedor. And so we think the real opportunity is once you have these distributed systems, um, you basically now, for the first time, have an internet for value exchange. That's the real breakout that's happened over the last couple of years. Bitcoin obviously being 
the proof point of, of the technology, uh, being able to you know confirm transactions without a central operator. But now you can kind of apply that so any bank now can correspond directly with another bank instantly um, without having to pay any carry. So it's just like HTTP, it's just gonna be a rail that anybody can use. And then probably most importantly, you then open up that entire rail to not just five or six correspondent banks, which will dictate a, a pretty lousy FX rate that cycle, you know, filters all the way down the system. But now any fund, any foreign currency fund in Hong Kong, London, New York, any private equity fund, any person, any merchant, uh, can put bid asks on anything of that. In more interesting news today, we've got this video that was shared by the digital asset investor. Now, this is a pretty interesting segment that you shouldn't miss out on. Listen in. All right, let's talk about XRP. Are you referring to Ripple? Because here's some interesting news. This just came up. You were ranting, so I Googled this. Hold on. Millions of XRP grabbed by whales. Important XRP versus Bitcoin signal appears. You know, I ran into a... Uh, person out in uh, where were we I ran it where were we I ran into a guy out in North Carolina who is a crypto guy and he believes XRP is the next big thing a lot of people call it bankster coin why do you think XRP is going to be in play here in the future uh, evidently some whales agree with you here because it's not controllable at a central location like Wall Street uh, when the SEC went after ripple to hamstring them to tie their hands behind their back to freeze their progress i thought well there's a winner just like reggie middleton they froze him they didn't make any progress at all in the 16 months when they froze reggie middleton he continued in development the only information technology software i shouldn't say that the only digital finance software development that Wall Street is expert in is fraud for derivatives, round robin bidding, for algorithm trading, for insider New York Fed trading. Wall Street is expert at software for fraud. They're not expert for software development on the new digital highway infrastructure on-ramp, off-ramp, trading window, they're not expert at any of that. They don't know jack shit about that. In fact, a year ago, Wall Street started advertising open source fairs. Come join open source. And it was fraud. Again, fraud, that's all they know, it's fraud. It was fraud for people to give their software for crypto and digital finance development, software development, and give it to Wall Street which then put it under their intellectual property as a gift. Wall Street is good at fraud. Okay, Ripple cannot be corralled. Ripple is about to move its headquarters out of the United States. Ripple has already cut deals with a couple of different BRICS major nations. By that, I mean Russia, China, Iran. Those three countries are going to run the BRICS. They, they should really do something about Brazil and fix that. I'd love to see Russia Chinese influence to fix that, but probably not going to happen anytime soon. In another tweet that was shared by Not Financial Advice Crypto, we can see that a global digital payment system comprised of an ecosystem of digital assets has been the plan all along. To say otherwise is a lie, as increasing the speed and agility of transactions is good for business. More companies than ever before are recognizing the need to shift from traditional service. We can expect to see services that allow businesses to bridge seamlessly between crypto and fiat economies to win widespread adoption. Listen closely. And we end up in a world where the monetary monopoly is basically replaced by a monetary ecosystem. And we end up in a world where we start honoring the complexity and the uncertainty we are facing in the age of the Anthropocene. This makes the entire system more stable, more predictable. And we start really financing our future by introducing a new currency system. In a dual currency system, we would start creating 
multiple second round effects each time you use the screen dollar each time we use the screen currency we would basically create one step closer to a common green future so what's required is so-called semi-permissive fully regulated distributive ledger technology based digital currencies issued by an authority like the central bank with a smart contract so what you're introducing with this blockchain technology you condition the consumption you condition the investment into our common future we agreed on already in 2015 to begin with you know in 2015 we we agreed that we want the sdgs as our common roadmap because we have a political consensus on these goals almost 100 percent on the globe and what's missing is the right financial incentives to make that happen and by introducing this blockchain associated condition smart contract incentive each time you touch that do you green dollar and each time you use that green dollar you create multiple green so-called second round effects this green currency system it suddenly becomes an incentive to swap your traditional ancient fossil projects into green projects and now as we wind up on today's video, we can see from a tweet by the Chamber of Digital Commerce that the SEC Chair Gary Gensler insists that the law is clear for digital asset firms. Yet, during the House Financial Services Committee oversight hearing, he was not able to clearly state if Ethereum is under the SEC's jurisdiction or not. Perriance DC breaks down the issue on Last Call CNBC with Sully. CNBC. Gensler did not give a clear and direct answer to Congressman Patrick McHenry, the committee chairman, who asked if Ether, the second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization, is a security. He responded, actually, all securities are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. It's that we are excluded commodities, but I would agree that a security cannot also be an excluded commodity and an included commodity. Digital assets are a spectrum of assets. There are digital asset commodities, there's digital asset securities, there's digital asset currencies, there's payment systems, there's NFTs, there's digital um, uh, collectibles. There are many different types of digital assets that there are many different regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction over this space. Uh, that clip you just played with uh, Chairman Patrick McHenry grilling the SEC Chairman Gary Gensler really gets to the fundamental issue the industry has, which is the need for regulatory clarity. And that exchange mm -hmm. was very emblematic of what the industry is dealing with. How I did a, it... uh, a Perry Ann, I did a I did a panel down in Virginia Tech about four and a half years ago, and with with Hester Purse, who is actually a member one of the SEC. Commissioners, this was four and a half years ago. We talked about the urgency of getting this done. It feels like the SEC is moving at about the speed of a hundred year old tortoise with a broken ankle. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Purse spoke at an event that we hosted about a year ago, and she said, unfortunately, the SEC has made very, very little progress. There has been no regulatory guidance issued by the Securities and Exchange Commission for the digital asset ecosystem, despite the fact that industry has been calling for it for over six years. Uh, coming back to that question of Ethereum, which really kicked off the entire hearing, how can it be that the Securities and Exchange Commission is taking the position that digital tokens, including Ethereum, potentially are securities. But then you have the CFTC also saying these exact same assets are commodities. How yeah. is there clarity in it, you know, when you have that when the agencies themselves don't agree? And even the, the SEC, the commissioners of the SEC, Hester Purse being one of them, don't agree. There is not regulatory clarity in this space, despite what yeah. the chairman testified on this morning. Well, Perry Ann, you know that it may not be about clarity so much as it's about control who ultimately is the regulator. Perry Ann Boring, U.S. Digital Chamber, appreciate it. As always, 
do your own research and always trade safely, guys. Please keep in mind, we're not a licensed financial advisor. All videos on this channel are intended for entertainment purposes only. Let us know what you think in the comment section below, and let's have a conversation. Thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Please click on that subscribe button below, and turn on notifications so you get informed when we drop new video. We'll look forward to seeing you on the next Money Side.